Hello guys, today we're gonna go over 3.2. It's a very short theoretical video, so let's begin. Um, first, they're talking about regression line in 3.2. Remember, the regression line is the line that best fits the data sets that you're given. Okay, it's also called the line of best fit, and it gives you, uh, you know, it's got a couple of other names, but it's either called the regression line or the line of best fit. Sometimes it could be a very good line that fits your model. Model. Sometimes, sometimes it could not be very good. So the you know just because the data they give you is bad doesn't mean that your regression line is bad. Again, you just the calculator does it for you, and it might just not be a good model used to represent that data set. But it doesn't make it incorrect. Just a poor model. Okay. Um, it's not incorrect, it's just very bad, but oh, it's not the exact same thing. So again, regression line is the exact same thing as line of best fit. It follows the linear, uh, you know, the, the linear equation for the linear equation parent function, which is y equals mx plus b, where b is the y-intercept and m is the slope. The only difference here is that it's called a hat. That's what it, you know, that's, that's a little sign there, which means regression line equals b o plus b one x and all they did was for some reason don't tell me why they flipped these two this is still the, the y intercept and this is still the slope but the exact same deal okay rise over run change in y over change in x there's multiple ways to find the slope both graphically and algebraically and in the same case there's many ways to find the y intercept so line of regression is pretty much a linear equation that is used as a mathematical model to predict or represent the actual behavior of a data set. Well, not so much behavior, but the trend kind of tries to fit the data. Don't say one thing to keep in mind. Let's say I have a linear model and I say, you know, children of these ages, let me use a different marker, children of these ages and let's say i stop at 20 more or less have this age and i stop at 20. and you know this is definitely not real let's change it to 15. that sounds a little better you know people are still growing all the way up to 15 16 then it plateaus out now if i were to use this exact same line and i were to measure a person who is 50 years old he would be a giant because again, the linear model is a straight line that extends infinitely outward. So the problem is when you're trying to use values that are very, very small or very, very big using a linear equation model, you can get some wonky or just answers that do not make sense. That where extrapolation comes in, the extrapolation definition pretty much. Extrapolation is the use of a regression line to predict far outside the interval of x values used to obtain the line such predictions are not accurate. So extrapolation is pretty much just an inaccurate prediction because you're using either incredibly high or incredibly small value based on the linear model that is used to measure a particular range. If you measure outside this range, it's just gonna give you a wonky result. Now note that these ranges aren't clear cut. They're not like, you know, the box plots or, or actual um, outliers, which you can calculate mathematically. Um, so just know that whenever you have a very long, a very big value, very small value, it might give you a crazy result. That's pretty much it for extrapolation. And let's go over the definition of a residual. Pretty much whenever you have a line of best fit or a regression line, some values will fall on the line, some values will fall above the line, some values will fall below the line. All the residual is, the, is the difference between the prediction and the actual value at that x value. So this would be the residual here, this would be the residual here, this would be the residual here. So let's say, for example, this prediction at, let's say this is x3, the prediction was, I don't know, 10, and the actual value is... Um, is negative or is actually 25 give me one second i'm sorry it's the opposite it's the predicted 
It's the actual minus the predicted. So let's say the actual value was 25 and the predicted was 10, you would end up with a positive 15, meaning the actual value at that point is 15 units above the prediction. Let's say here, let's use a smaller one, the actual value is negative 30 and the predicted value is 45. Again, you have the actual value, 30. Well, let's not use this negative. It's always the actual value minus the prediction, negative 15. That means that the actual value is 15 units under the prediction. So we use residuals to see how off our measurements are at that particular value. And it's also incredibly important for R squared. You'll see what that means a little bit later on in this video. So the residuals are the actual value minus the predicted value. And the answer tells you if it's positive, the actual value is above the prediction. If it's negative, it's below the prediction and by that many units. Again, this can tell you how good or bad a model is at predicting certain behaviors. You want to have the, the, the least amount of residuals as possible overall throughout the entire line just to make it a better model. So that's residual. Um, we talked about the y-intercept and the slope. We've, been, we've gone over that since sixth grade. No need to go over that. You can probably search other videos for slope and intercept so we can skip that definition. And least squares regression line. That's a fancy term for line of best fit. Again, we square the residuals because we actually don't want negative residuals to cancel out positive residuals when we're adding all the errors of a line. That's why we square them and then add them to have you know absolute values of these errors or mispredictions. So let's say you have this data set. I don't know. Again, even though you could draw a line perfectly well here, the way these regression lines are drawn is they try to minimize as much as possible having the least amount of total residuals. That gives you the best approximation. Okay. When you try to minimize the residuals at each point, you get a more streamlined or a better prediction. Most of the time, these models are not perfect. They're actually, <laughs> there are actually some linear models which are just horribly, horribly not good, but they're not incorrect. They're just not useful. All right, so keep that in mind. And one thing that is very useful is a residual plot. Now, when we're given residual plots, usually you see the, the scatter plot next to a residual plot. And as you can see in the book, normally a scatter plot has a whole bunch of, you know, scatter plot dots. And then you have a sort of line that has a, a slope. And this is a scatter plot. Now, when we're looking at a residual plot, and also one thing, here you might have the actual values, 3, 6, 9, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. When you're looking at a residual plot, it's different due to a couple of visual things. First of all, we will have 0, positive, and then just negative 1, negative 2, 1, 2, 3. And the line on the residual plot will always be horizontal and it comes out from zero. That's step one. Now step two, you want to see how the data is plotted inside this residual plot. And what will this tell you? It's going to tell you if your linear model is good or it was useful to predict the data that you're seeing or if a linear model is poor to predict the data that you're seeing. And there's pretty much two kinds of behaviors. Either you're gonna have it randomly spread out above, or you're gonna have them all fall on the line more or less. This, these two mean you can use a linear model to predict the data set that you're given. The other thing that could happen at zero is that you could have some sort of curve 
a pattern curve. It could go up, it could stay down, but if you see a curve in the residual plot, that means that you are not, it's, it would not be a good idea to use a linear model. Maybe you can use the curve model, exponential or other kind of model in order to predict the data. And I do believe that's it. Now note that pretty much the calculator does all of this for you. Uh, I don't expect anybody, even though some exercises in the book say do this by hand, don't do it by hand. Use your calculator. I, I really don't require any of my students to do this by hand. It's just don't. Understand how to use a residual plot. Understand how residuals work and so you can evaluate residuals. And that's pretty much the important part of this class. Now, there are some other definitions we're also going to go over. Um, the standard devi def deviation of a residual pretty much is the exact same thing as standard deviation, only you're using the residual values instead of measurements or heights or weights you're using residuals. What is this useful for? It just tells you more or less the, the, the expected size of most of the residuals. Okay. You want to have small residuals, as small as possible. So there's no like hands-on practical use right now, but for the moment, just know that you can do the standard deviation of the residuals just to have a basic idea of their size, okay? And the last new thing, which is important, is called the coefficient of determination, or R squared. Remember, when you draw a correlation, or you draw, when you find a correlation line or a line of best fit, it gives you an R value, that will, which will be between one and negative one, an R value, which is one, between one and negative one. You know, it could be 0 0.9, negative 0 0.3, whatever. Now, that is R. When you actually get that value and square it, that's why it's called R squared, you square it, it's actually pretty useful. We use it a lot in medicine and certain, um, when you do biostats and, and statistics and re, you know, review medical um, publications. R squared tells you, well, let's go over the actual definition. Pretty much, it says, the important part of the definition, it says, it measures the percent of the variability in the response variable that is accounted for by the least squares regression line. Or another way to say this is, how much of the change is explained by the explanatory variables. I mean, it's actually quite useful. It helps you determine, for example, there's a really good, there's a really good um, exercise in the book under that definition, which talks about the price of a car and miles driven. And when you look at the R squared for miles driven, it's like 0.8. That means that the price, 80% of the price of a car is determined by how many miles it has been driven. The other 20% are other factors. Color, model, bumps, bruises, I don't know, just other things. But the main factor, 80% of the price can be explained by miles driven based on the information that you have been given. So R square is incredibly useful to see, for example, weight loss pill. Okay, what percentage of weight loss is actually more or less, even though it's way more complex than this in real life, a very basic, you know, understanding of R squared is like, okay, what percentage of weight loss was actually the pill that I gave these people? The other percent could have been diet, exercise regimens, the same, you know, their, their bio, um, their bio rhythm, their basic, their basal metabolism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So R squared is incredibly important when you're trying to find actual links between things. Well, not really, because again, correlation does not cause, does not <laughs> determine causation. But it can help you explain how much maybe one variable might explain another variable. But we're going to go into that way deeper later on. So that's it for today. Have a great day.